All right, we should be live. And we're going to check Facebook and rather YouTube, make sure everything's okay. Okay, looks like we are up and running. This is good. All right, we'll wait for a few seconds here. So on the table, we have a whole bunch of radios. And uh, what we're gonna be talking about is, let's see if we get the stream quality above. Hey, Ridgen, how you doing, bud? And we got Edgy American. Shane, good to see you guys. So uh, I want to answer some of your questions that you guys have posted and go over some radios and stuff. I just figured out how to get all this set up on the uh, phone. So I do apologize if it's a little wonky looking. Uh, let's see, uh, is everything all clear? Can you guys hear me pretty well? Or am I uh, doing something wrong here? Okay, excellent. Thanks, Shane. Hey, Tom Corn. How you doing? It's good to see you guys tonight. So let me pull up my uh, Discord here and uh, the questions that I had seen, and I'll try to answer them for you guys. Thank you, Risen. I do appreciate that all clear also. Uh, it's my second time doing a live, but my, my first time I had a problem with the audio and I wasn't too happy with the camera gear. So I reverted back to the Samsung Note 9 above and I have it plugged into power. So we won't lose any power during the middle of the stream. Now let's take a look here and see what kind of questions we had. Just going over some stuff. Okay. Uh, so I'm seeing the questions I had posted or someone posted before. And let's go over them. Oh, by the way, happy birthday to the Marines today. Don't want to forget that. It's very important. I was never in the military myself, so I'm just a regular average dude. But uh, I do have friends and family who've been in the Marines and the Army and the Air Force. So uh, happy birthday to the Marines. All right, so we have a question that I got asked before about a week ago. And the question was a budget mobile setup for say high desert location possibly potentially in and around arizona california so the first thing about radios before i start recommending and saying hey get this one or get this one is to understand what each radio is capable of and categories of radios if you will so it can get kind of lengthy but uh, i broke it down kind of in a size category so if you notice on the table here towards the left we have smaller type of radios and smaller tools for example we have small radios here we have our small pocket knife here and we have our small light here micro sized if you will so this section represents sort of like the micro size variant variants of radios uh, to kind of relate it to edc gear a little bit easier i figured when explaining different kinds of radios to people. Next up is sort of like a, a middle tier here. And we have sort of middle tier type of tools. We have the Leatherman 
oops, that's the magnetic base on this light sticking to it. We had the Leatherman Sidekick along with a Victorinox Swish Champ. These are kind of like medium-sized, medium-duty multi-tools along with these AA slash 14500 battery operated lights. We're not going to go into too much stuff about the lights and the multi-tools. It's just a comparison. But for now, these use AA batteries and or 14500 lithium ion cells. They're rated for EDC use and a little bit more heavier duty than, say, the micro lights there and the micro tools. So this would be like a normal EDC carry here, this category of radios, these four radios here. We got the ASUS, we got the Kenwood, and the Elenco. Moving up the list here for more, say, commercial purposes and work duty, meaning they have to last a long time on the job, we have the work duty type of radios on this side of the table where we have the 18650 powered lights, lithium ion powered lights. So they last a little bit longer than their AA and micro counter counterparts, right? And then we also have for the multi tools to represent heavier duty items on the side and related to the radios, we have the Leatherman Super Tool 300. It's a more heavier duty type of tool than say the Leatherman Sidekick or the Victorinox Swiss Champ. So these radios represent more heavier duty stuff. And there's a bunch of other crap on the table here we'll get to in a bit. So I just wanted to kind of clear up what's on the table first, what we're looking at. So there, if there's any questions, let me check chat here real quick. Okay, we are all clear. We still got Tom Corin, uh, Edgy American in there in Risen. Thanks for joining. So uh, to answer the question about budget sets up, setups, I don't have an example of a budget radio here. Normally, a budget radio would be sort of like a what most people go to is a Baofeng type of radio. Those are a piece of kit, piece of tool, which is very affordable, and it gets people into the hobby of radios. They usually come in multiple band modes and you can operate mainly on fm with them and they do have a receiver i believe in it too if i'm not mistaken for fm broadcast bands too so the baofengs would be a budget option if you're looking for a budget tool just entry flat out entry level like for example if you're going to get a multi-tool knife uh, a baofeng would be like the equivalent of maybe one of the kmart or walmart brands of uh multi-tools not saying it's junk it's just you pay for what you get, basically. So uh, on that kind of level, uh, or for example, these skill hunts and the ace beams, instead of getting those, you probably get like one of those three AAA dollar store lights. It's a flashlight. It works. It does the it does the job. So it makes sense. So that would be like a Baofeng ham radio. It's not exactly a direct comparison, but you kind of get the idea that the more money you put into something, the more probability you'll have getting quality out of it, potentially. Uh, so that applies to ham radio here. Now, each radio has a different runtime for uh, being used, transmitting, receiving. Obviously, the bigger radio is going to have a little bit more power output and a little bit more runtime because they have the capability of running bigger battery cells. For example, this Motorola MTS2000, you can put bigger, higher amp hour batteries in it and you can run it for longer durations and it's designed to run longer in the field but at the expense of size and weight and infield programmable features so we won't get to too much into depth with all the radios but we'll just go over some general things some radios you'll notice they have like a keypad in front that's like a dtmf type of keypad meaning you can front end program some of these radios something you cannot like the motorola and to a lesser degree the elenco here and if you notice these micro ones on the left here they they do have somewhat of a keypad, but not a full DTMF keypad, meaning you got numbers and actual letter characters. There are ways to do that in these, but it's very, uh, <laughs> very late 90s UI mode kind of thing. Like with those old flip phones we used to have, it's kind of like that. It's not exactly the most fun experience texting on any of these keypads, I'll be honest with you. But I don't want to get off on a tangent. So to answer the question for like mobile rigs, you don't necessarily to need to buy like a mobile radio to have a mobile setup in your car, especially a budget option. And uh, to show how you can put a mobile option on your radio, we'll take my EDC radio. This is the Yesu VX7R. And these are typically SMA adapter type of radios. So I put an adapter on here 
which changes the connection point, right? Because underneath this is a small little tiny SMA adapt screw adapter, and they do make SMA to B and C connectors to SO239 connectors. That's like a type of connector that would connect to your coaxial cable. Let me bring it out here so you guys can see while I'm explaining. Oh, hey, we got uh, simple preparedness in here. Uh, Brett, good to see you. No, don't worry about it, Risen. That's okay. If you got a Baofeng, that's that's the best you got, man. Like, you, everybody's got to start somewhere. So I don't like to knock people for their gear. It's kind of doesn't make a lot of sense if you're trying to get them into further investing into the gear, you know? So Baofengs, they work. They get the job done. So don't worry about that. And let me fill my coaxial cable here. Give me one second, guys. Okay, so I have a, a very, very light duty coaxial cable. This is RG174. There's different types of names and brands of cables out there. This is a highly lossy cable. And what that means is this is like the lo most lossy cable you can get probably for amateur radio. Um, I use this for my HF radio, but just as an example, you can plug this item into this radio here, right? So you have your coaxial cable plugged into the radio. From the coaxial cable, you can go out to an external antenna. Usually, typically for your car, most people will opt for, and it's what I use myself, is a mag mount. Now, mag mounts are basically a magnetic base antenna. It's usually a quarter wave. We'll get into that later, but it's a base, basic vertical antenna. And this cable will allow us to connect to that antenna outside externally. Now, there are a variety of different cables that offer better uh, prevention of loss of signal to noise ratio. And this has got the highest loss, so it's not the most efficient, especially with these kind of radios. It's just an example. I have a bigger cable here, and I'm going to show you guys. It's like kind of a big brute. We have the LMR Ultraflex 400 type of cable. So you can kind of already see how thick this cable is. That's because it's got a lot of shielding, and it's just more efficient at taking the radio signal and preventing it from getting lost through heat dissipation, et cetera, et cetera. So basically it's a more efficient way of getting your signal from the coaxial cable to your actual external antenna. And that's what we usually try to promote in the ham radio world is better coaxial cable matching impedances, et cetera, et cetera. So without getting to too much depth of it, you probably want to go for like a thicker, flexible type of cable. Uh, my standard for these kind of radios I would recommend is the Ultraflex 400 series. If you're trying to go lighter weight, Maybe an LMR Ultraflex 240 type of cap. It's a little bit thinner than this, a little bit more manageable in the field. And for my, what I do, I, I go up on hilltops. I use this cable just for a short run. So it's not that big of a deal on HF. I don't usually use it for VHF work. I have other cables for that, like RG316, which is not the best cable either, but it's a little bit better than RG174 cable. So we've gone over that these hand held radios you can use them for mobile setup you just need some type of coaxial cable preferably a higher quality one and some sort of antenna now antennas are very it's its own like subcategory with radios in the ham radio world we uh we not only talk about the radios we use but different kinds of radios and different uh sub genres of like building our own antennas making our own ca coaxial cables getting into digital and uh, all sorts of different modes. There's some guys who strictly do Morse code. It's it's like a, a big world out there for radio. So I'm trying not to scare many of you away from it, but just be aware that there's a lot of specific niches you can go into when you get into radios. My particular niche is I like building antenna systems myself. So uh, that's sort of like my, my thing. I'm an amateur at it. I'm not an expert. And obviously I need more time to learn, but antennas we have a few of them on the table here so while we're talking about it we'll just go into it briefly uh, i do have the external antenna or rather a uh, telescopic and a non-external one this particular one's my favorite one it's an old 1980s one that i got at a auction and these go for high price i got this for a good price it came with this radio actually when i got it on ebay on auction 
uh, about five years ago, seven years ago. And uh, it's been working pretty well since. It just telescopes out. And it's cut for a specific kind of band of radio. So you can place different antennas on your radio to increase the performance of it or to increase the portability of it. And what I mean by that is if you look on the table, you notice all these radios have different size antennas for different purposes. So it's sort of like um, lights. You know, you carry different lights or different knives on you. They all have different size blades, etc., etc. Same kind of idea with radios in, in a similar sense where each type of size is going to do something different. For example, this Kenwood THF6A, if you compare it to the VX7R, you can see it has basically like a stubby antenna is what we call it. Or I kind of joke around, I call it a dummy load because essentially that's what it is. But basically this is such a condensed version of, the, of any of these other antennas on the table, or most of them, is that it's not very efficient at getting a good signal out, but it is good enough to make the radio happy and not kill itself when you transmit with it. Sometimes if you have the wrong kind of antenna on a radio, you'll get what we call high SWR, standing wave ratio, and that energy will be reflected back into your transmitter. And what will happen is you will potentially damage your transceiver that way and blow out the RF finals usually. So that we try to find antennas that are resonant and keep the radio happy with SWR. Now, I won't get into it, but high S, low SWR does not always translate to an efficient antenna system. Just keep that in mind. But going back to the antennas here, variety. So this is a little bit more easy to carry discreetly if that's what you're trying to do, be more like covert with your radio transmissions. And shorter range too. If you don't want to get out as far, you probably want to pick maybe an antenna that doesn't shoot out as far. Now, these are all what we call omnidirectional antennas. And before I continue on, I just want to check the chat, see uh, how everybody's doing, if we're all kept, caught up and whatnot. Oh, yes. Uh, yep, uh, that's very true. <laughs> Edgy American. <laughs> it's a good idea to be self-sufficient with uh, communications technology. I agree with that. Uh, would I consider teaching a class on radio? Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, I'm not the best teacher out there, and I'm not the most knowledgeable person on radios. Um, in fact, the more I learn, the less I realize I know, which is kind of strange sounding. But um, I guess the point is, I don't know everything. And if I don't know it, I'm going to recommend you to people who do know it. <laughs> there are guys in this hobby who, um, for example, for the antenna making part, I, I just use a basic antenna analyzer. They have a computer system which measures the type of lobes that it emits and the SWR, the impedance, the length of coaxial cable, everything, all the things get calculated into this computer and they cut it exactly and they try it out and it works perfectly. Me, I, I'm kind of like hit and miss. I got to experiment with it out in the, out in the yard, if you will. <laughs> and uh, I, I make antennas from all sorts of things. I sometimes buy my own uh, antenna wire or I scrap it from other things like metals and from the dumpster etc etc that's kind of fun to do that or old tv antennas if you will cut them up reuse them so but getting back to the antenna thing here these are all basically dipole or quarter wave dipole or five eighths wave in some cases uh, what do we mean by like quarter wave and five eighths wave well generally speaking it's it's the wavelength of the band that you're on say for two meters it's 144 megahertz to 148 megahertz so that would be the two meter bands two meter wavelength right you take half of that wavelength now of two meters right and then you cut that up in half again and those two halves as you've got there from the half i know it sounds confusing you'll have two sides of what we call a dipole um so to better get a conceptualized idea of it we can take let me take this off here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So dipole basically is two halves that make up a quarter wave antenna, a half wave dipole. So four of these will make the full wave of whatever band you're using, but I don't do that. I just use dipole antennas. And if you think about it, there's a positive and a negative, right? And it's not strictly like traditionally what we'll think about electricity 
it works a little bit different without getting too much into it, but basically you have a positive and a negative, right? And so for a dipole, you have two halves. Now these radios, if you notice, they only got one antenna on them, right? So the other question then is where does the negative or the ground go to? Well, really the ground on, on these go to the chassis of the radios. And as you can see, some of these radios are different sizes. So the ground side of things, the other half of that dipole, if you will, or at least the negative side, um, some of them are a little bit more efficient than others, as you can tell. So it varies. Plus, you also have to take into consideration when it comes to radios. When you hold a radio, I don't know if you guys have noticed in the past, but sometimes your reception will change. You'll hear things better. If you, pit, if you come up close to a radio or near it, it will receive better. And that is due to you know, your body. It does affect the radio's uh, properties, the uh, antenna's properties as well. So some radios are built like that with that in mind too. So they're not strictly just using the radio as a ground plane, they're using part of you in effect in some cases, not all cases. But so the point is these radios, they only have usually what they call a quarter wave cut one or a, well, I think I do have... I believe this is a 5 8 wave, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I think this one's the 5 8 wave. It's coiled down here to get... So basically, you have ones that are coiled. Uh, this is probably coiled to this Motorola one, if I had to take a guess. Meaning, it, it's got the electrical length of a 5 8 wave antenna, but it's condensed down. So it's not as efficient as a you know fully one. Extended one, basically. Um, now, it, it's, it gets confusing from here when we talk about antennas. I mentioned before that there's different kinds of bands, right, for these radios. And typically what you'll find commonly on the market, you'll see with the Baofengs, right, like Risen. Uh, Risen said he had a, a, basically a Baofeng radio. And the Baofeng is typically what we call a dual band type of radio. So what is the difference between like a dual band and say mono band radio? Well, I do have them on the table here. For example, this is a mono band radio, meaning it only does one band wavelength. Or, for example, this is a two meter band radio, meaning it just does transceiving on two meters. That's it. It doesn't do any other bands. There's some other bands that we can use as ham radio operators. Uh, for example, 70 centimeters is a band, six meters is a band. 220 megahertz or 1.25 meters is another band. So you have all these different bands we can access as ham radio operators. And even for guys who don't have ham radio licenses, you can still access parts of certain bands like the GMRS, the FRS radios. Those are what we call ultra high frequency radios or UHF band radios. Some of these radios on here are VHF band radios, which is very high frequency. The difference between VHF and UHF is that typically VHF is a little bit bigger wavelength than UHF. So two meters versus, say, 70 centimeters, obviously two meters is bigger, right? So you have different interactions with those wavelengths. We won't get to too much depth yet with that, but it will come to handy when we talk about being out in the high desert near, say, California or Arizona or even Texas. Sometimes you might want to consider using VHF over UHF radios. Sometimes our UHF radios are better at penetrating through uh, certain things like urban areas, dense forests, but they typically may not or may or may not go as far as a VHF radio with a little bit bigger wavelength. And the atmosphere plays a role in that too. We're not going to get too much into the atmosphere part. VHF radio is sort of like VHF band radios I tend to, in my experience, get out a little bit further in open space. So that's typically what I run here. Um, but going back to the model band versus dual band thing, this is a model band radio. Now that we talked about bands, two meter versus say 70 centimeter, VHF, UHF frequencies, right? This is a model band radio. It operates on a two meter band. Now, what's interesting, if you notice with the Baofeng, right, Risen, you you're saying, okay, well, if this is from 144 megahertz to 148, why does my radio receive, let's say, FM broadcast bands from, what is it, 87 megahertz or so up to about 103 megahertz, right? So 
Why is that? Well, sometimes radios have a built-in wideband reception in addition to being a monoband radio. So this one has a reception range of 136 megahertz to about 174 megahertz approximately. So this radio can not only transceive on a small part of that VHF spectrum, but it can receive on a wider swath. So there are pluses and minuses to that as well. And for reference on this radio, I it, it's, it's a little bit silly, but I actually have a dual band rate antenna on this one. Not that that affects the mono band performance too much or too much negatively, but you can run stuff like that on a mono band radio just for reference. And you can run mono band antennas on dual band radios. You just got to be careful about transmitting on that particular band of radio. Back to this though. So we have wideband reception and we also have a small portion of transceiving within that wideband reception. So there are pros and cons to that. The, uh, the pros to it is that you can hear more and listen to more. And typically for this monoband radio, I can listen to local PD, fire, auxiliary channels, sometimes marine, and even MERS type of channels, so business band stuff as well. The drawback is when you're up on the mountain, right, if you have a wide band reception, you're open to more interference, usually harmonics, third harmonics, things like that. So uh, there's intermod, right? And that basically is just interference that comes on your radio when you're on top of the hill. There's other strong signals that might overload your receiver in here without getting too complicated with it. Basically, this can get overloaded with other signals from other frequencies. Fairly easy compared to uh, better front end radios. Like, for example, this Radio Shack one. This is an old 1980s radio, okay? It's from the 80s. It's older technology. It's also a model band radio, much like this Yaesu VX170. This is the Radio Shack HTX202, if you guys are curious about gear. This is also a ham radio. It's a 2-meter ham radio, and strictly only receives 148 to, or 144 to 148 and only transmits on 144 to 148. So it has a tighter reception range and then it also has better front ending in here so it rejects other signals outside of that specified frequency range whereas this vx170 may not so that's important to note i typically like my older technology even though it's not as efficient as some of the newer stuff as we see here the older stuff certain has certainly has a audio quality to it we'll call it or a vintage feel to it and generally it does have better filtration or unique filtration capabilities and tones and sounds so that is one reason why you might want to look into the older technology the other th reason you might want to look into the older stuff here the monobanders at least is that they are less expensive to get and they're usually on par with or better than baofengs one other thing to consider with the baofengs is that if you put it on a scope and an analyzer you can see when you transmit with it, right? So when you go to transmit with any kind of radio, you'll you'll see wh where you're transmitting on that frequency band, but then sometimes there's what we, they have is spurious emissions along with your transmission, meaning, so you transmit on one part of the frequency, right? Then you have spurious emissions, which kind of hit around all around the band. So now you're flooding the band with a lot of extra noise and, and junk, and that becomes pretty crowded if you can imagine say in a case of like 9-11 for example um the radio waves are packed full everything shut down you can imagine how much that will overload in that band so if you have radios like baofengs all talking at once on different frequencies it's gonna cloud it's gonna basically cloud out uh the uh band and you typically want to try to upgrade your baofeng when you get a chance to something a little bit less uh interference prone basically but these are monoband radios, and so is this Motorola MTS-2000. So on the right here, these happen to be monoband radios. It doesn't happen to have anything to do with being full-duty size radios. They do make UHF and VHF dual-band radios, too, in the commercial more work setting as well. So don't, don't feel like, oh, my gosh, I, don't, I have a dual-band. It's not a work radio, radio. No, it can be. So just keep that in mind. Let's check chat here before we get over to dual band radios. Oh yeah, Edgy, don't 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 feel dumber. Um, uh, you're very smart, very very smart, sir. Uh, um, let's see, Brett. Yep, 
So you guys are talking to each other. That's good. So, okay. So we went over like the model band stuff, some of the antennas, right? So this is a model band antenna. This is a model band antenna. This happens to be a dual band antenna on this radio. It's kind of weird. I know I'll get a lot of flack for that from the ham radio guys, but it's what I use right now. What I, what I have for the radio. So it works fairly well for that for now. Let's go over some dual band radios. Now, dual band radios, we have here, here, and here. These four are dual band radios. The Yaesu VX3R, the Yaesu VX1R, the Yaesu FT1D, and the Elenco DJMD5. Dual band as in they both, they all do two meters so that they can talk to these radios here on this side. And in addition to doing two meters, they can do 70 centimeters. So another band that they can utilize in in the uh, radios so that's good so now you have more options so let's say you're on the two meter band range and you have an issues communicating with somebody you can say hey let's cue us well let's jump over to the van and then cue us wide to this frequency so basically you can say hey uh we're not going to use two meter band anymore we're going to go to 70 centimeters and that might be a little bit better for our uses so it's a little bit more of a multi-tool type of radio right like these multi-tools here right so you have a little bit more functionality as opposed to another comparison. You could say that these are just single blade um, <laughs> knives. I know Edgy American is going to go nuts with that. Um, and these are more like kind of like multi-tool type of knives, the dual banders and quad banders, tri you know, tri banders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in regards to a mobile setup, you can get a monoband uh, radio for your mobile setup. It could be an HT in the car. I would recommend that actually. Uh, Risen, I believe uh, you might take interest in that, like where you, where you are. Um, you could probably make use out of that because then you can unhook your radio from the car and go m portable with it, what we call portable by attaching a portable antenna. So mobile rigs, you can't necessarily do that. You need the power for that. So another thing with like these radios for a mobile setup, you might want to consider a handheld first. And if you're looking to get more power output, then you can probably go to a mobile radio. So, but... Aside from that tangent, we'll get back to the dual band radios. So let's take this VX3R here, right? Now, this is a very small micro radio. It has 2 meters and 70 centimeters you can transmit on. And it also can receive wide bandit. And what the ranges this can receive over these radios, the monoband ones, is this can receive AM broadcast stations. It can receive short wave. It can receive also... FM broadcast stations all the way up until about 999 megahertz minus the cellular band. And it's not always going to be AM mode or FM mode on all those frequency ranges, but it does do a wideband reception. So basically, most of the emergency services in my county here where I live, they operate on UHF, which this thing does transmit on and receive on. And they also operate on VHF, which also they also transmit and receive on as well. So, and then you also have the broadcast station. So this is a fairly good micro radio to get your hands on. They don't make this model anymore, but they might find something similar to this potentially. I believe ICOM might make a radio. This is a Yesu branded radio. It's the VX3R. Came out about 2007, I think. So it, it's been out of production for a while now. They go for a large or a very high price in eBay. Uh, a side note for all, any of these radios here, if you're looking to get a good deal, you can sometimes find it on eBay, but generally you won't. What you have to do, and I recommend you do this in your local area, is go to what they call a ham fest. Now, a ham fest is basically a garage sale or yard sale, but on a bigger scale for radio gear and radio related items. So you can find some really good screaming deals there. If you have a buddy who's into radios, right? A ham radio buddy, or just somebody who's very knowledgeable about, about radios, they can direct you and say, hey, this is a good buy. And, and you go with them to the ham fest. You have to pay a fee to get in, of course. It's like $7, but you'll see a lot of ham radio guys there. They're selling the radios for low because typically their wives don't like them having all radios. So they're trying to get rid of them and get out of trouble. Um, <laughs> it's a true thing. Uh, you'll find antennas there as well. Radios, you'll find mobile rigs, you'll find portables, you'll find base stations. That's a third type of radio that we're not showing right now, but you have portable ones, mobile ones, and then you have base station ones. Now, any radio can be a base station radio, but base station like specific radios are heavy. 
they use a lot of power and they're very grounded so but they offer a lot more options than say some mobiles and portable ones but going back to finding uh, the Yesu VX3R, you can find it at a ham fest. The next one next to it is the other micro HT. So typically with micro HTs compared to these other HTs on the table, they're very convenient for carrying around portable, as you know. You don't have to stick a huge antenna on it like the VX3R has a smaller antenna. So this can fit in my pocket. I can go to work, turn on the broadcast radio, put on some tunes, listen to it as I'm working. These work very well for that, for a very personal little radio. Nobody will know the difference. It's very discreet. So if you're looking for a discreet setup or a minimal EDC setup, like a lightweight one, these micro Yesu radios are excellent for that. As you can tell, this one's pretty beat up. I got it from eBay also a few years back. It was pretty beat up then, and ever since then I've been really beating the hell out of it. But it's still going strong. This was made back in the late 90s, I think early 2000s. So again, late 90s tech, early 2000s tech. Radio technology generally tends to hold a, a good value if it's maintained so and these are going a lot for a lot more than what they were sold for i think they were sold for about 90 bucks back in the day or so when they went on sale nowadays you can find them on ebay for about 130 to about 100 to about 350 which is quite a large price for this, something so small and old in my opinion so i probably wouldn't pay more than about 130 for these uh you might be able to find these at a ham fest a guy might be selling them for like say $45 working with a bunch of extra accessories. So you can get good deals at Hamfest for these kind of radios is my point. And these being so small, they offer a lot of pros for EDC use. Uh, the cons though, compared to the, some of these other radios, we'll get to the cons now, is that their battery size doesn't offer a, lot, a, a long runtime and transmission time. So just listening and then transmitting is two, two types of runtimes, right? So when you're transmitting, you're burning a lot more battery power out of these radios. And they only last for about, if you run on high power, for about 20 minutes of constantly holding down the key and talking. So with these smaller radios, you want to have an extra spare battery handy or a power cable to power them off of. Uh, in this case, for this particular radio, I have a setup. It's not on me at the moment. Let me let me check, actually. I want to show you something with the, with this particular radio anyway. Hey, ACR Protect. How you doing, bud? I'm just reading chat while I'm looking for my stuff. Yeah, you guys keep chatting. I'm just finding some of the gear to show you. Okay, so I don't have the cable that plugs into it. I kind of misplaced it, but I'm going to go over the VX1R. And so we went over some of the cons with this, right? It's small. doesn't run for a very long amount of time. The other con with this radio is that it doesn't have a high output power since it's got a small battery. The transceiver in it doesn't output a lot of wattage. For example, this radio does... On low power, 50 milliwatts, which is a very min minuscule amount of RF coming out. It does 500 milliwatts on the battery, or, or about thereabouts, coming out of a resonant antenna, is what we'll call it. We'll just say that this is resonant for now in that band range. That is, to compare to these other radios, these do approximately, as they state on the website, about 10 times more power than this on its higher setting. So 10 times that it's going to be, we're getting about maybe five watts on all the rest of these at maximum output. In some, in some cases, they might even do more than five watts, uh, depending on the uh, conditions. But I digress. These have low power transmi transmission ranges. Uh, so the reach of these is a lot less so than some of these other radios on the, on the table. So that's something to consider for the size. So that's the trade off, right? Now, I found out few years back that I do have a video on my channel showing this actually if you dig back enough on the VX1R this is a solar panel battery operated USB battery bank um, it has two AA batteries in it and it, they're nickel metal hydride batteries so this can charge the batteries 
and from that or just run it off the solar panel you can run usb cable out from here into the dc port of this radio here meaning this battery could be potentially dead i can charge this battery with just this little thing out in the field of course it's going to take a long time because this is kind of a gimmicky solar panel uh if you ever used any of these solar panels you guys you'll, you'll know these take forever to charge but it does charge the other nice thing about this if there's no battery in here if it's dead completely you can run this radio off of this battery charger which is amazing and if you have another battery charger even better a lithium ion one will, will definitely allow you to transmit with this at about maybe 700 milliwatts or so when there's a dc power going into into this port it can take up to six volts it'll transmit at about one watt out and i think for low it does about 250 milliwatts out with an external power source plugged into this radio so you can imagine you can get out a little bit further if you have the right kind of ba battery bank for this uh, solar ba battery pack here or if you have your own battery pack and these are just the cables that come with it so this is kind of like a micro little edc option i have this in probably i want to say five six seven of my edc bags my various edc bags i had this exact setup in a silver emp resistant bag so this all nest nestles into one bag and fits into those little pouches that i have let me see if i have it behind me okay i got it right here so <laughs> sorry for the wait let's let's read what, what's going on too Oh, thanks, AC Air Protect, Protect. I appreciate that. AC Air Protect's in the house. Uh, my buddy Brett's in here, Simple Preparedness, and Edgy American Shane. If you guys haven't um, seen their channels, uh, Simple Preparedness has a great YouTube channel, just uh, before we get onto this stuff. And so does Edgy American. Edgy American Shane, he sent me a knife I just recently reviewed uh, as a gift. I want to say thank you to him very much. And Brett also, amazing guy, very cool dude, very chill. <laughs> he... He, uh, he's very good guy to hang out with. He's got a lot of cool and awesome ideas. He's like, he's like your best buddy, you know, like watching him. I feel like I'm part of the family, if you will. So check out Simple Preparedness and Edgy American on their YouTube channels. Those guys have some really interesting content and just they're really chill and, and they, they're really knowledgeable. So I definitely recommend you guys go check those guys out. I think Edgy American, he's got like 800 something, uh, subscribers. I can't remember. We were talking last night. Um, so go subscribe to him. Try to get him up above that uh, threshold there so he can get monetized a little bit. And uh, check out his live streams, too. He does great live streams. I haven't been able to watch everybody's live streams lately. I've been so busy, so I do apologize for that. But um, we have Civil Preparedness in here, good YouTube channel, and Edgy American. And if any other guys have a YouTube channel, let me know. I'll just I'll shout it out here. Um, but uh, getting back to the uh, EDC kit. So I have this VanQuest one. I haven't fully done a full review on it let me open it up here it's kind of hard to open up on a table full of like antennas porcupine uh table with antennas sticking out but here's an ec bag that uh i have made i completed i think back in late august early september i did show it before um because i got this as a review item from van quest they sent it out to me for review this is the uh edcm husky just put my cover back on here little plastic cover so behind all this this crap we have a silver bag and in that silver bag you guessed it is basically our vx1r so so that silver bag contains these items and an extra emergency charging cable and then uh, basically an, one of these small old lights inside of it so if an emp hits i have some kind of resiliency against it now i don't know if those bags are really going to work in an EMP or CME, coronal mass ejection spike. But it's better than having nothing, in my opinion. So, you know, I, I started updating my kits about last year around this time and uh, remodifying all my EDC kits to kind of combat that kind of potential danger. Okay, so we went over the micro ones, the pros and cons. We didn't go over everything. Um, I don't want to turn them on and start transmitting and because that's going to get into a really, really long in-depth video. I'm just trying to get through the basics for you. So we have our micro tools here, micro radios, okay, hence the micro 
Min Victorian X Midnight Mini Champ here and the Olay i102 EOS Pro Special Edition Micro Light, Micro Tool, Micro Radios. Moving on to the more standard EDC size radios, the more compact radios, we'll call them. Uh, these are in a kind of a nice niche because they offer a lot of the uh, power outputs of the bigger, more commercial, more uh, long, longer running radios, but in a more compact size. So you get the a little bit of the micro sizing in here, like the benefits of that, but not exactly the extreme benefits of a micro size radio. So uh, some of these radios, they're they're dual band radios, particularly the FT1D, like we said before, and the Linko DJMD5. So we'll start with the FT1D real quick, because this is kind of an, a nice nice radio I've had for, gosh, uh, I want to say probably since 2016, February 2016. That's when I got my first uh, radio. And so we're going to get into a sort of different category right now. It's called analog transmitting radios and radios that are capable of transmitting digital information in addition to analog information uh, separately. So this model particular model transmits in analog and in digital the digital encoding and decoding in here is going to be c4 fm or yasu fusion their own line of internal digital radio uh, i guess programming if you will now uh, you're going to probably ask well if this is a digital radio, it can transmit to another digital radio right well that depends uh with the ham radio community and the i guess the big names like you have big names for like knives right you have leatherman Victorinox, Gerber. Well, in this case, you have Yesu, you have Kenwood, you have Motorola, Linko. Same idea. Big businesses out there make all kinds of quality radios. This particular Yesu model has their own internal way of doing things. That's the Yesu Fusion. So it will only digitally talk to another digital radio. Now, some of these radios can send digital images at like, I think, 320 by 240 pixels. They can send uh, beacon information this particular model that i have here has does fusion and it has what they call a gps in the top here the gps is used for transmitting your coordinates and you can do that in fusion and you can also do that to a tower uh, in ham radio before we get on to more in the depth we'll, we'll explain what what i mean there when i say tower i'm talking about a repeater system so Let's go ahead and grab these two radios. We're just going to pretend that these are just regular radios. One of them is going to be a repeater tower. Say this is our repeater tower, right? And this is our radio. So a repeater tower, what it does is it takes your signal as you're transmitting to it, right? And it's going to repeat that back out, usually at the same time. And the way that works is it's transmitting on, it's receiving on one set of frequencies and retransmitting out on a different set of frequencies. So... You could be like, for example, one four six nine seven zero transmitting uh, or receiving, but you can be transmitting at one four six three seven zero. That's like an offset of like negative six hundred, for example, right? So you have enough spacing between the frequencies where you're not causing too much interference. And I'm not going to get into too much stuff with the repeater system, but basically you're transmitting on one set of frequencies, and then you're also the other guy who's listening. You transmit into the tower. It's rebroadcasting your transmission out on a different frequency. Everybody else is listening. So it has to be able to repeat your frequency out. And sometimes they have multiple repeaters all linked up in certain areas. So you'll be getting a wider range of transmissions. That's in a basic, very basic nutshell. I'm not even getting to too, you know, hammer radio guys like, yeah, yeah, we've heard this before. But basically that's what you're doing. You do that with GMRS stuff too. They have GM, GMRS repeaters. Um, it was a little bit different. You can buy a license outright for that. You don't have to study for anything. I think it's like $35 a year for GMRS license. I do recommend you get it. Um, they do have repeaters on various bands. I'm not going to go into all the bands that they might have it on, but typically you'll have them on VHF and UHF bands. So we have a radio that goes into the repeater, repeats your signal back out, and then they go into the repeater and repeat their signal back out to you. And that makes it possible for you to do communications of, uh, long distance it's not just strictly from um you know let's say one ham radio to another that's peer-to-peer -peer, right simplex right this is what we call duplex operations but it's not fully duplex it's not like a cell phone for example a uh, good way to relate to that your cell phone is actually going to a tower and it's also receiving at the same time 
via a duplex system. It's a fully duplex system. This is kind of like 1.5 uh, duplex, if you will. Uh, it, it's Duplex really, what it comes down to is being able to talk and listen at the same time. That's a full duplex system. So it's not really duplex in some ways if you, you, if you want to look at it that way. So it's technically not, but the idea is that you can still get out, come back out on a different frequency. You just got to wait. And uh, there are some radios out there that actually do duplex operations that are VHF and UHF. And let me see. If, I don't think I have any on the table that actually do that here. Um, some of those radios can act as a what, the, what we call, since uh, we'll pretend that this is a fully duplex type of radio, meaning it can receive on VHF and it can also retransmit out on UHF at the same time. We call those crossband repeaters, right? So the repeaters that we were talking to before, talking about before, are monoband, basically the same band. The crossband repeaters are a popular option if you're going to be mobile and you want to set up a small repeater operation temporarily. You, some handhelds can do that. They can be programmed to do that, or you can buy other systems. And uh, let's check chat real quick just to see if there's any questions before we keep going on about the repeater stuff. Awesome. So it looks like we have a lot of guys uh, subbing to each other. That's that's really good. Edgy American, ACR Protect. We got True Budget, EDC, and Prepping in the house. Hey, bud. Good to see you, man. Uh, thanks for visiting the live stream. I appreciate a lot of your videos, man. I, I, I've been watching you. I haven't had time to, to comment, but I've seen like, your shorts and stuff. I, I really enjoy watching what you have for your smaller kits. Um, it's really it's really cool to watch. I've been meaning to reach out to you. I've just been so busy trying to catch up on review items, but it's good to hear you. Guys, if you haven't seen um, True Budget EDC and Prepping, he has some really fantastic videos on budget gear, small EDC gear, and he knows his stuff. He's also a first responder, so check out his channel. He's got a lot of cool stuff going on there. Uh, if you guys haven't subscribed to him yet, definitely check out his stuff. He's got a lot of good ideas, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. He knows, he knows quite a bit about knives, too, actually. I, I was watching some of his knife videos, and me being a beginner knife guy, I, I figure maybe I should watch and get around and try to learn more about uh, folder knives in particular. So definitely check out his stuff. Okay, so uh, yeah, I see you guys mentioned prep content. That's cool. Um, yeah, by all means, uh, it, it's inspirational. I, I get inspired by different things, so it's like an art. So getting back to the uh, repeater system where we left off, so you have the monoband repeaters, and then you have crossband repeaters. Again, you can transmit from one radio, right, going into this one as a VHF radio to VHF back out, right? And then you can have another guy out there who's on UHF instead of VHF, and he'll hear from that crossband repeater. So it operates a little bit differently. And I'm oversimplifying it just to explain the concept uh, to you. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, read up on the books to get a better, clear definition, and ask a lot of other ham radio guys. They'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I'm trying to break it down in, in a more, I, I guess, because um, it's very complicated stuff. i got to figure out how to uncomplicate it, if you will. I'm not so good at doing that, but uh, I digress. So dual band repeaters, repeater systems, getting back on track to the sizing. Again, these mid-tier radios, what I call mid-tier I use that term loosely. These can be pro tier if you use used right. Any of the tools on the table can be like a pro type of radio if you know what you're doing. So going back to the Yaesu FT-1D, this does analog and it does digital. Some of these radios only do digital with the exception of the Elenco on the table and a little bit of the Motorola, but we won't get into that. Uh, these are the only two digital radios on the table and they can't talk to each other digitally except for one thing. We were talking about the GPS on the FT-1D, uh, back where we left off. The GPS logs your coordinates in here, and this transmits out the coordinates either on digital or what we call a APRS system, or Automatic Packet Reporting System. Now, what that means is in America, we have designated frequency, but usually, if you go elsewhere, it's a different type of frequency, but a lot of repeater towers, like we just talked about, are set up with not only the repeater site, but they also have something to receive this specific type of digital communications, which is called APRS. Now, what APRS is, it stands for Automatic Packet Reporting System. 
And basically, it takes your GPS coordinates and you program your call sign or whatever whatever kind of identifier in the radio here. And when it hits that repeater tower, if that repeater tower is connected to the internet or if it's uh, sending out, repeating the signal again out to a tower that is connected to the internet somewhere far out, out of the region, it will mark your location with this radio. So I guess a similar concept would be those uh, spot threes from Garmin, uh, the Garmin in reach type of stuff. It, it's similar in the sense that it can report your location. And in some cases, you can send a basic text. You can even text people from this radio to their cell phone uh, if it's set up right. So you can, uh, <laughs> surprisingly, text somebody's phone with this radio or uh, go to a database site. Uh, for example, when I do what they call SOTA or summits on the air, I believe there's a certain thing you type in the text and you send it to the beacon into the tower and it'll log your location and say, hey, this guy's at this location on this hill. Look out for him on this frequency. Um, the frequency for this particular North American, uh, the 4850 states basically, is 144.390. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the frequency. Let me double check real quick. Yep, 144.390. So that is the frequency. You'll not only be able to transmit on that frequency, but you'll listen for other incoming APRS signals, automatic packet reporting signals. So this has a built-in system where it can decode Receive, receive signals also and I'll show up on the screen as like hey uh, uh, I'm just going to make up a call sign here GG135 it's not a real call sign but just bear with me is three miles to your northwest and it'll show me if they if they have their GPS active and reporting their location accurately it'll point out a little compass on this thing and this is just you know to this specified model the FT1D line it'll show me oh he's three miles to my northwest okay I know where he is now they may not seem very useful at first, but you can actually go online to APRS.fi. And that's a website you can open on your phone, on your computer, and it will map out all the people who are using this at APRS system that's reporting in. So you can track them where they are, where they're heading. Now, that has a lot of uses. There's a lot of pros and cons, obviously. Um, in search and rescue operations, usually sometimes it's not uncommon or unheard of to hear Part of the members have their own APRS system. So when you go out in the field, this makes uh, search and rescue a little bit easier when you're reporting in to a command center or HQ, if you will. Uh, the, the, the cons of that is that everybody on the internet who knows your call sign and knows where you are. But there's also a double-edged sword there. You can program this to report a false coordinates, and then people will follow that. So information can always be a double-edged sword, just to keep that in mind. But I use it for summits on the air, and if I'm doing a rescue uh, up in the mountains for my job, uh, for reference, I work in the parks, if some of you don't know, I'll bring a radio like this with me or my Linko, and it has APRS capabilities. The Linko here has the same capabilities as the FT-1D when it comes to transmitting a APR signal. This cannot decode it, though, however, this one can. So uh, decoding is not as important because maybe... Uh, it's important, but in some cases it's not as important, uh, but I won't get into that. So that's the the unique thing about this particular radio, the FT-1D here as a dual band radio. It has the capability of transmitting your coordinates to a tower. If that tower is hooked up or if it can digipeat that over to another tower, you're in luck. It doesn't always work if you're in a valley. It may not work. Even if you're on a hilltop, it may not even work too. So it's very it's not as reliable as everybody makes out to say, to be, but it is a nice thing to have. If you really want to, if you're worried about not having cell service and needing to get a message out, get one of those Garmin inReach things. You can get this as a backup. It is definitely well worth the wait, in my opinion, particularly because it has this particular model also has wideband reception. Uh, I can listen to AM and broadcast stations. It does shortwave radio reception. It's got an AM antenna bar inside of it too, not to mention, I don't want to get too much depth with, but it's got a lot of capabilities that make it a fantastic outdoor radio, not to mention that it's also IPX4 rated for rain. I brought this on trails when I worked for a number of months with AmeriCorps. I dropped it in mud, bring it in downpours. The thing works fine. So that is FT1D. Uh, I'm, not, I'm trying to get through the medium range radios here so the next one next type of radio uh we're just going to go over link briefly this does dmr type of digital radios it's similar to the uh motorola type of technology digital mobile radio which is a motorola type of digital thing 
this Olinko can do that, and this can also do encryption. So I don't want you guys to get confused like, oh, it's digital. I mean, it must mean it's secure. No, it's not secure. It's just a layer of privacy. It's not secure. This Olinko can do encoded and decoded, so it's got a cryptograph in it to do AES 256-bit encryption or up to 256-bit encryption, but it's also highly legal to transmit encrypted signals. So I won't uh, push for that necessarily, um, but just know this model can do it. It's not a waterproof model, unfortunately. If it was, I'd be really happy with this particular model. Anyway, going back to dual bands. So that's the other two dual bands we have on the table. Next up in this medium range, we do have tri-banders and quad-banders. And before we move along with that, we're going to go to the chat here. Oh, hey, we got the KD2YDN. Hey, my man, Chris. Guys, if you don't know KD2YDN, this guy is the man. I love this guy and his uh, adventures going up in soda and uh, parks on the air. He's out there almost every day going on a new peak. And uh, that in the ham radio community, that's like us going up on a mountaintop, trying to make as many contacts as we want uh, or can in some cases. And we get points for that. And the point system is called summits on the air or parks on the air. You can get... Um, you can apply for certificates and things like that. So it's part of the, one of the more fun parts of the hobby. And it also facilitates good field operations and uh, how to set up in the field. So uh, you guys check out KD2YDN. He's definitely got his stuff down pat. He's learned very quick. And if you guys uh, check out his channel, he's got a lot of cool videos. If you want to see a guy in action in the field, check him out. Chris, my buddy, Chris, good to have you with us, Chris. Okay, so uh, we covered model band radios, dual band radios, repeaters, uh, analog and digital type of radios. So we're going to go on to tri-band and quad-band radios. So what that means is we talked about radios that do 2 meters, radios that do 70 centimeters. Now we're going to talk about radios that can do 1.25 meters and or basically 6 meters. So... We'll start with the Kenwood. This is one of my favorite reception radios, probably my favorite reception radio in the whole group here. And we'll get into that in just a moment. This is a tri-band radio. It does 2 meters, 70 centimeters, and 1.25 meters. And it's got a little stubby antenna because I use this one in my EMP kit and it's my EDC radio for one of my kits for the winter. Um, this is a dual band antenna, by the way, this little stubby antenna. But I digress. This, this radio can transmit 5 watts, and close to five watts on almost all those bands. Some of these radios will only do like maybe four and a half watts on UHF and five watts on VHF, or in some cases lower. This one can get up to about four and a half, five watts with the right antenna. And a little side note, you want to make sure your antenna is resonant. If you guys want to see what a tri-band antenna looks like, take a look at this. So you notice these other antennas, they have coils in the base, or sometimes they don't. They just have a little quarter wave whip or a small little... Antenna on top of here. In some cases, we have a 5 8 wave antenna. But this is a tri-band antenna. So we, if you notice, there's the center portion here, which is coiled, and an extended part out here to get the 2-meter band in there. And then we have the 70-centimeter band then in, in here. And then we also have the 1.25-meter band in this antenna. So it's a tri-band antenna. I have not seen or seen too many quad-band antennas that are made for HTs. So, but we'll go over uh, that in a moment. But just to show you a comparison to an actual tri-band antenna made for HT. So this is the Jetstream JTH2. It's an aftermarket antenna. Most of these radios only come with like a basic rubber ducky antenna. That's usually a dual band antenna. This particular model did come with a tri-band antenna. I just don't have it on here because I like my B and C connectors. Again, I'm, I'm very big on B and C connectors with a few exceptions uh, on the table, as you can tell. Simply, the reason why I like BNC connectors, I'll just explain it really quickly. See how fast that comes off? With a SMA antenna, you have to unscrew that all the way, then unscrew something else onto it, and it has a bigger likelihood of breaking. Now, whenever you, you, you add additional stuff onto your antenna ports like this on the radio, the, the cons to it is that it costs more money and that you're also getting insertion loss. Basically, you're not maximizing the potential and, and covering up all the leaks, RF leaks, if you will. So I'll take that trade off personally uh, for a more robust antenna system. Uh, you guys who've been in the military, 
Uh, so you remember your your PRC or affectionately known as the the Prick radios, the Prick seventy seven, the one hundred four B, uh, the one fourteen B, uh, the one fifty two Harris radios. Um, you got a whole Maxon type of radios. You guys will remember all that stuff. They have really robust connectors with low losses on it. So this is not this is all prosumer grade level stuff, with the exception of the Motorola. Motorola actually, uh, military has used that uh, quite a few times. Various iterations of that type of, not this exact radio, but some of the types of radios. But we won't get into that right now. Going back to this, this is a tri-band radio. Uh, getting back on track, and you can use tri-band antennas, which will make the make the radio happy and your signal get out much better. This particular model has wideband reception. And what makes this unique amongst all these others on the table is that it also listens to HF or single sideband decoding. Basically, we have radios so far that have done FM mode, right? Most of these transceive on FM mode. They all do, in fact, with the exception of one on the table. And they can all receive, or, or a few of them can receive AM mode, which is the FT1D, VX3R, VX1R, the VX7R, and the Kenwood here. So these are radios that can receive AM broadcast stations and short wave. In addition to short wave, there's usually two cla a breakdown of short wave or HF, what I like to call HF, what we call HF. Uh, you can do HF, HF AM operations, and then you can do lower and upper sideband and CW mode in uh, HF or more or short wave, if you will. So this radio can decode all four of those. And it not only can do that for the HF bands, what we call the HF bands, usually anywhere from like 1.9 to up to about, mm, well, uh, about 28 something, 10 meters, we'll, we'll call it, right? Up to around that portion of the band, that's basic HF. So about roughly 1.9 megahertz to about 28 or 30 megahertz, if you will, HF coverage. So this covers a wide swath in the HF band. But it also does single sideband reception in 2 meter, 1.25 meter. So uh, you have 2 meters, 1.25 meters, and also 70 centimeters. Why does it do sideband in those modes? Well, ham radio operators typically will use upper sideband in those types of modes. It's just what we agreed on. And sideband transmissions typically can go a little bit further than, say, FM mode and AM mode type of transmissions. So that's important. And if you're really keen on receiving a good amount of radio frequencies, this is the radio to get. This is the smallest radio that I could find that is a tri-band transceiver and also an HF sideband receiver radio. This also features a uh, little AM antenna bar in it, much like the Yesu FT1D inside and the VX3R. So this has really good reception capabilities. If you're looking to do a mobile radio, this would be something to get. I recommend it. It's also weather resistant. It's not rainproof, but it's a little bit more ruggedized. So it's not exactly like the FT1D or the VX7R on the table. But definitely recommend it's my favorite HF type of radio for ham radio operations. And I would definitely buy these out. They're, they go anywhere from about $150 to about $300 used on eBay. But once again, if you go to a ham fest, you might be able to haggle a guy down to maybe 90 bucks, Something like that might even come with extra accessories. Things to look out for when looking for radios, right? Let's stop there before you go on to the quad band radio and see who's in chat. Yes, uh, uh, Brett, uh, simple preparedness. Yes, these can pick up both air and marine signals. Air usually is in, I think, 118 megahertz or so, thereabouts. I might be off a little bit with that, up to about 136 megahertz. And they're usually in the AM portion of the band, although you can find aircraft and other transmissions lower than that and even higher than that. Just depends on the, uh, shall we say, the type of, uh, I guess facilities that have the aircraft or the country that you're in, uh, marine, uh, these all can receive, most of them can receive the VHF marine channels. Marine channels, I think they're in the VHF spectrum of like one, I want to say 150 to about 156. Uh, they're all spaced out to avoid the uh, police, auxiliaries, EMS, and other business type of bands within that range. So uh, I can't remember the exact um, 
frequencies for marine VHF units. There's also, obviously, you can use these radios, uh, the waterproof ones anyway, for marine use as well. For example, two meter range. Just because it's a two meter radio doesn't mean you can't use it while you're on the water. You can absolutely do that. When you're in an aircraft, that's a little bit different because you might mess up the, uh, the navigational systems or you might cause a malfunction. So that's why you got to be really careful when uh, you're flying. <laughs> Some of these radios have the ability to knock out temporarily or in some cases permanently electronics i'll give you an example if i use this rate one of these radios with the uh a two meter transmission at five watts near my audio recording equipment it'll knock out my uh, sound devices mixer which is what i'm using right now to uh, uh get this audio to you through the live stream so uh definitely be careful when you use radios on the aircraft that are not um been tested but to answer your question yes they do receive marine and aircraft uh, this one does, this one, uh, I think, yeah, this one does, these all do, this does, and this one does. This does not. This is my specialized radio, but I digress. Um, text for the deaf, uh, let me, I, th I believe with the Yesu one, the FT-1D, you, you would type on this pad, and there's later iterations of this model. This is not the only model that's out there. They I think they're up to FT5DR now, so to give you an idea number-wise, that has a touchscreen on it, and it's much, much, much better for typing out text. So, yes, you can send text, uh, Brett. Absolutely. Simple preparedness asking a really good question. One, one wouldn't necessarily think of the uh, uh, radios as a non-audible tool, but it can be. At least the, the digital mode ones can be. Um, sometimes you can also, I know with certain radios, I don't have it on the table, you can uh, use a computer with them. Digital modes is what we call it, right? And it, you can use them on certain bands. Some of them you can use on a two-meter band for sure. There's this thing called packet radio, Brett. And what packet radio, this is a little bit older technology, but the, the concept is still the same. You're sending out digital signal, and you, you log onto your computer, and you check what we call a message board on the computer where you update your information, but it's only updated via radio, via what you have on the table here. And you'll take a radio and then like maybe, we'll, we'll pretend this is the packet modem, right? You take a radio, it goes to the packet modem, and then, you know, you type in what you want, this sends it out, you know, the signal out, and then it gets captured, and then you can uh, type on a message board. The trick is, uh, simple preparedness is, having some sort of encryption on your communications. Because once you do that, right, everybody can listen to what you're saying and see what you're typing. So th that there's one caveat there, okay? Um, so just keep that in mind when you do stuff like that. There's more advanced ways of doing it. There's WSJTX. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry. There's another type of uh, digital mode. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, I... I Dabbled in FT4 and FT8. That's a type of digital mode. Not the most funnest mode, to be honest with you, but it does work for reports and stuff. There's other modes where you can transmit to radio that's on something and decode it and transmit back. You can type a message back and forth that it is possible to do, is what I'm getting at. Uh, you might just require slightly different radios than what we have on the table. That's all. Okay, so getting over to the VX7R. This is my main radio, EC radio, for years. Uh, I've had this for about seven years. Used it on the trails also, in the mud, in the dirt, when I worked for AmeriCorps. And again, we have the BNC connector, the estimated BNC adapter. This is a quad band radio. So much like the tri band and dual bands and the mono bands, it does two meters, 70 centimeters, 1.25 meters, and now it does six, six meters. And six meters is a really nice band. And the reason why it's a nice band, in my opinion, is that we commonly call it the magic band or magical band, meaning when certain atmospheric conditions happen, the band does what we call opening up. And what that means is your signal now is not just localized. It can skip over long and go out further. And that can happen with two-meter radios, too, to be clear. It can, and Canon does happen with two-meter but a little bit more rarely, a little bit more comp, a little bit more um, on, on on this end of the six meter band, it can and does happen. And we do have a uh, compromised six meter antenna. 
This is not the most efficient one, but this is a BNC antenna, which as you can see, you can unscrew this portion. This is a, a, a Yesu antenna. I forget which model this is, but this has the six meter whip part on it when you screw it on. And this also comes with a dual band uh, screw on point too. So that it's a modular system, which is kind of nice. The uh, bottom portion here, you're probably good, uh, probably want to do a tiger tail is what we'll call it, or a counterpoise to increase the efficiency of the six meter antenna. So again, I can plop this on my VX7R and I can start doing six meter operations on the field and be up on the mountain. If I'm on the mountain, there, there'll be guys who are fanatics uh, for each, there's fanatics for each band. Some guys love doing two meter stuff strictly. Some guys love centimeter, centimeter stuff. Some guys love the 220 megahertz or the 1.25 meter stuff. And then there's guys who absolutely are diehard six meter band fans. Meaning they have radios all set up and configured for FM, AM, single sideband, uh, six meter transmissions. Now this particular model is unique in, in these is in that it also does FM mode transceiving and it does AM transceiving. And the AM part is in the six meter band here on this radio. Meaning this radio has the potential of going out a little bit further than some of these radios here, potentially, with the right setup and the right timing. So... Uh, that, that's what makes this particular one unique, and it's also the only one on the table that's fully submergible. So not only does it have the wideband reception, again, this also does the wideband reception like the FT1D and the, the VX3 are down here. You can listen to EMS, auxiliary marine, aircraft, auxiliary military channels, police, fire, you name it. This thing can capture all of it if it's analog. Most of the stuff has been digitally encrypted nowadays, but there's still analog transceivers out here, especially where I live. So I do hear a lot of the, the stuff that's going on around my county. So these can act like, these wideband receivers can act like a temporary scanner, if you will. They're not as good as a dedicated tool, like a scanner. So if you're gonna go for reception and receiving, you're gonna wanna be able to buy a scanner. Sometimes it works well in conjunction with these type of radios, but I digress. This thing has quadband transceiving capabilities. The 1.25 meter, I will note on this, the 220 megahertz band, you only get about like 300 milliamp or 300 milliwatts out. So it's very, very low power. The AM transmitting on this on 50 meters, uh, sorry, 50 megahertz or six meters is about one watt out on the AM. And the AM doesn't sound so great on here because this has a waterproof membrane on the mic and doesn't have a whole lot of... Um, uh, in the UI, a lot of ways to edit the gain on the mic and things like that. So it's not the most uh, pleasurable chatting and transmitting experience, I'll, I'll say, with this particular type of radio. So there's the trade-off, right? But it's practical and it can work in emergencies with the right equipment. Again, you do need the right antenna for the right band. So you want to make sure you get the proper antennas. And I would not recommend this if you have the time and the space to deploy an actual better resonant dipoles for six meter or a what we'll call a yagi which is another common type of antenna for example <clears throat> with this particular radio you can get a cable like we showed earlier like the coaxial cable and this particular of device is what we call a dipole antenna post or a banana post as well i like to call them um, you can screw in wire here and wire here and you can string it out evenly on both sides if you cut it just right for six meters when you when we talk about cutting antenna lengths right we talk about the wavelengths if you cut this for a half wave dipole for that particular band let's say six meters you can get on the air with this type of device from a coaxial cable to here and then the two wires and typically you can use speaker wire the bigger the uh the gauge of wire the more bandwidth you'll have more wiggle room, so to speak, for transmitting on on the, uh, the band. So typically you wanna go as thick as you can if you can afford it and if you can support the weight. So that's what this little device allows me to do in the field and I, I pack these in my uh, radio go bags. So this is a dipole adapter is what I'll call it. There's other types of dipole systems out there. Others have balance to kind of mitigate uh, bring bring the uh, impedance range within acceptable tolerances but we're not going to go into that that's getting a little complicated 
just trying to keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> KISS, K-I-S-S. So going back to the quad band and the, uh, almost dropped that there. So this is a fantastic radio. If you're looking for an EDC radio, I highly recommend you go with this one. If you don't mind the terrible audio reports when people are listening to you, you have to really get up on the mic and chew on it. And the speaker quality on this one is kind of tinny. So it's not the most pleasurable listening experience. Aside from that, this thing, you can tell I beat the crap out of this thing. It's its still going. Uh, the only weak points are the top knobs can get damaged and come off, but you can find replacements for that easily. And there's a ceramic filter issue with these type of radios that tends to go. It's like a $2 component. You can open this up and do it yourself or send it into Yesu. They still repair these. I think the fee is about 40 bucks plus shipping and handling. They'll repair it. Just get it back to you, so... It's still in service. That's the nice thing to know about these uh, Yesu Japanese-made radios. They're still in service, and they're still being serviced. So uh, definitely a good thing to have. And in some cases, you can do what they call a Mars slash CAP, Civilian Air Patrol, Military Auxiliary Radio System. I think that is what it means. You can do Mars CAP modification on this where you can actually transmit out of the four bands. And you can do that for most of these radios, too, if you have permission and... Uh, you know, you're within your legal rights to. So there's always something like that to keep in mind. I won't discuss that on here and how to do that and all that, but you can email, email me later if you're interested in that. Anyway, that is the quad band radios for the middle tier section. Now, um, let's check the chat and see who's in here. Oh, hey, we got the uh, Pharmacy Seeds Network. Hey, my man. Good to see you. Been a while, my friend. Oh, this is great. Uh, we got Alex in here, too. Just uh, scrolling up and checking the text right now. Sorry I haven't gone back to you guys. Um, we got Alex Unearth and Aus Minerals in here. Thanks for joining. That's a cool name. I got to check out that. Uh, I, I'm big into minerals and stuff and fossils, actually. That's why I named the channel the Fossil Channel, believe it or not. Uh, about, I think, maybe 12 years ago, something like that anyway. Uh, I can't remember when I made this, this channel, but uh, I was originally going to do videos on fossils in, in my area. And I have a whole yard full of fossils. But uh, very cool to have uh, another rock hounder in here. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing well. I hope you're doing well, CJ. It's been a while since we chatted, and I do apologize. I've been meaning to get back to you and uh, uh, Steve. Uh, so uh we'll we'll reconnect uh i figured i got a lot of questions about people curious about radio guys if you don't know who the pharmacy seeds network is this is my buddy cj and uh he knows a lot about radios talk to him about radios he can explain more in depth for you in fact uh ask he can probably explain a lot of these radios better than i can um he's another ham radio fellow ham radio opera fellow brother and uh he, he will be able to guide you guys in the right direction with questions and things like that we're just going over a basic tour of radios trying to get out some of the basic information out there and uh we'll do a q a real quick here uh just to see if anybody has, had, has any more questions um pretty much getting towards the end of the whole live stream but i'm going to stick around for a while and answer questions hang out with you guys because this is kind of cool it's my second time doing a live stream and uh, i'm not fully used to it so okay yeah doing pretty good nice yeah, ACR Protect, um, you could definitely, uh, if you have a lot of questions about radios and stuff, um, look up in your local area, right? There's going to be groups of people called amateur radio clubs, right? These amateur radio clubs have guys similar to me in them who are obsessed with their gear and stuff, and they're, they're very much, it's all within the realm. You know, guys who collect radios tend to collect knives, guys who collect knives tend to collect lights, lights um you know tools it's all within the same realm of stuff right uh my specialty obviously is lights and uh radios but you'll find guys who have this kind of specialty and they can show you physically um what you're seeing here on the table so uh definitely a good idea to get out and look around for local ham radio clubs and there'll be sometimes there'll be people there who will uh they'll have like older radios they got to get rid of they might even donate some to you so that, that is always a place to hit up. And as long as you're willing to sit and listen and learn, 
um, and talk to them on radio. So honestly, a lot of these guys, they don't, uh, a lot of the ham radio guys, especially, they, they don't have people to talk to sometimes, believe it or not. Um, and they're always looking for a buddy to say, hey, let's test out my antenna I just built. That's a common thing we do. Uh, like, for example, if I make an antenna system, right? Uh, this is a auto transformer I made. It's a type of cor ferrite core in there. And it's the, the windings are a little loose, I know, but it works fine. Fantastic. I've used it on HF radio. Basically, this is an end fed half wave antenna system. What that means is it's a particular type of antenna system where I feed the wire from one end as opposed to being in the center of a dipole, you know, on either end. This just comes from one end out and it's a little bit more practical in the field for me but i digress there are guys out there in the uh, community right the hammer community who are, love to have you in there with them because they can test out these little contraptions that they make with you and you can give them like a signal report in the air and they're more than happy to talk with you so the uh, motivation is there uh, for guys to talk to you on the radio if you're interested in getting into radios especially amateur radio and ham radio you don't have to get a license <clears throat> You can still build stuff like that for uh, certain parts of real, like, for example, uh, CB. Now, a lot of guys, they'll, some, I shouldn't say a lot of guys, but some guys, they'll, they'll snuff their nose at that. Me, I won't. CB is another way to communicate, and that's, what, that's how I got started into ham radio as a kid. Um, for reference, I got my license, my ham ticket, as we'll call it. It's a no-code ticket. They, you, there used to be more score requirements back in the day, uh, and then they opened it up to, like, no-code tech. I was one of the first, well, not first, but I was one of the earlier guys to get a no-code technician license at the age of, uh, gosh, let me think for a second, uh, 97, so 97. Okay, yeah, I was 12 years old, so uh, I was 12 when I passed my test. And my first radio, this is not the actual radio that I had, but my first radio was a HTX-202, this Radio Shack radio. And, and that's why I still have it now. Well, I still actually still have my original radio. It doesn't work anymore. I can't fix it. But I have another one of those because I love them so much. Um, so you can, if I can do it at 12 years old, basically anybody can do it. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Just got to, well, most anybody, I should say most anybody, should be able to study for the exam. Um, as far as uh, uh, Brett, I think... Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Looks like there's a message that get held. Uh, it's, oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I forgot. I had like that Autobot on um, uh, CJ. It kind of like holds out the profanities and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's that's the. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yes, it goes into Iron Man's chest. That's right, Brett. <laughs> um, like I said before in the beginning of the, I guess, the, the, uh, the live. Uh, I did explain that there, there's niches in ham radio. We'll go over that. Some guys, they're into building antennas. Some guys are building or into building specifically just radios from parts, right? Some guys are specifically just into building uh, receivers, transceivers. Other people are, are into building mounts for cars, for example, how to mount your antenna on the car efficiently. Some guys specialize in just doing that. And then there's other guys who specialize in programming the radios, typing up computer programs that can interface with your radios and do really cool things. So the hobby of radios has a lot of different niches that, that kind of checks off at least one area of interest for a lot of people into everyday carry items like we are, right? Or uh, preppers, right? So th there's a lot of knowledge within the community itself, and it's really cool to check out. Like some of these guys, they're... Um, they're way leagues smarter than me about this kind of stuff. Uh, I just happen to have a compulsive obsession with radios and playing with radio. So, um, like I said, the Pharmacy Seed Net Seeds Network, uh, CJ, he's uh, he's really good at radios. So is KD2YDN, if he's still in here, Chris. Uh, you guys can hit him up. He, he's the mega super dude out on the hilltops. If you want to get good at radio, <clears throat> there's several things you got to do. You've got to research your gear for one, right? Uh, you got to study your book so you know how the radio works. And then number three, uh, after number two, you've got to go out and actually use your radios. That can be inside your house. The bonus is getting out in the field, figuring out what antennas work for where you are, not always on the hilltop, and then operating in 
I would say very bad conditions like rain, snow, ice. Uh, I don't ever recommend in a thunderstorm, but sometimes you got to do it. The point is you're going to learn a whole lot of experience, not only just owning a radio and figure out how to use the UI system, program it in. That's another skill you'll need to acquire because sometimes you won't have your radio and a computer at the same time in the field, meaning you got to front end program these radios to go change your frequencies on the fly. That's also a good thing to know. But also operating, learning how to um, what we call navigate a pile up. And basically what a pile up is, you say you're calling out for people to contact you on the on the frequency, you'll get maybe potentially <clears throat> anywhere from literally five to about 15 guys or more calling you at the same time. You got to be able to pick out in that pile up of call signs and say, hey, this is the info I got to get to you. Here it is. Everybody else, stand by. you got to be able to navigate that under pressure and transmit your information efficiently. <coughs> Excuse me. Throat's got kind of dry here. You transmit that inf information efficiently. So uh, that's an important skill to have as an operator. And that applies not just for voice, but also digital modes and Morse code. If you're doing that, especially Morse code, that's a very high-skilled area. And there are guys who do that. Uh, KD2YDN, Chris, he does that quite a lot in Hilltop. He just started getting into it, and my man is rocking it up there. Oh, uh, greetings, uh, Julio from uh, Orange County. I'm glad to have you in here. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so it's uh, you know it's it's a it's quite a uh, a varied field much it's like it's like not the world of knives right so knives i never knew there was so much variation i mean i had an idea but same thing with radios basically is what i'm saying so uh, good amateur radio practices once you get your radio what you want to do uh, uh like i'll reiterate when you get your tepper radio whatever it is you want to learn how to pro program the radio the memories the memory banks with the radio itself without the computer the reason why you want to do that is sometimes you'll be out in the field and somebody will ask, hey, can you punch up this frequency and store it in your radio and we're going to use that? you got to be flexible in the field. So learning how to front-end program your radios is key to being a successful operator. Um, I, I don't know too many successful operators who don't know how to program their own radios. It is a rare case, but it does happen. But the point is you want to be able to be very skilled with what you have in your hand know how to use it. Now, if you're a guy like me who has probably, I think I got maybe, hell, I got tons of these radios, I get the UIs confused sometimes, so that's okay. <laughs> There's so many different vari variations of these UIs. Uh, it can be kind of overwhelming. You'll think one works the same way in the other. No, it's not like that. It's, it's unfortunately a little bit complicated than that. It's like one's a Mac, one's a Windows, one's a Unix, one's a Linux, one's a, you know, you got a whole bunch of different UI systems in the radios. But basically, learn how to front end your program radio. Learn how to uh, set up and deploy your antenna systems, i.e. antenna systems like this or similar to that, like dipoles, efficiently, efficiently, safely, and in a timely manner so that you can set up quickly, get on the air, what we call getting on air, meaning transmitting, talking and then getting off the air so that people don't come and find you or the you know thunderstorms don't get you that's a skill in itself um understanding how your radios react some of these radios they're better they have better heat management than other radios for example military radios are designed usually to handle longer transmission times because they have heat sinks <coughs> excuse me dry throat some of these radios these prosumer type radios they don't have the capacity to be transmitting at full wattage for long durations so you will have to step down your power with the radios and when we're speaking about ham radio operations right out in the field what's nice about some of these waterproof ones is that you can kind of put it on or near or inside water to cool it down really quickly without getting the microphone port covered with water that's a good small way to you know side note to keep your radio cool especially in the hot desert i know it can get hot out there uh where uh, texas is and in california so you want to be able to find a radio that's thermally optimal for your range 
And uh, coincidentally, if it's really cold out, if you have any of these in like freezing weather, it's best to keep the radio on your persons where your body heat will keep it from freezing. Sometimes these liquid crystal displays, especially on the uh, lower end radios, I'll call them like the bow things, they can potentially break. The batteries could potentially rupture. So you want to be able to keep your radios in an optimal thermal condition, both humidity, water, and temperature rating. So that's also something to consider with a lot of these radios. Now, uh, the Motorola, for example, will be able to transmit a little bit longer on higher power because it's designed to do that. And even uh, to a degree, the Radio Shack to HTXO2, although this does get hot too pretty fast. Um, and these small radios, they have less and less thermal heat dissipation. So they're really not designed to uh, output five watts or more five watts or so for a long period of time it's just a burst mode kind of like these smaller lights here to make a comparison for to make it a little bit easier some of these lights they do have higher modes but they will only last a short amount of time for one two they heat up relatively quickly now the bigger lights they might have a little bit better heat dissipation now this particular model is not the best example uh to show this is the uh kr4 noctagon, noctagon rate uh light and this is a quad band light uh Quad emitting light. Well, get my terms confused here, see? Uh, but it does have a copper heat sink, as you can tell. This copper one uh, tends to deal with heat a little bit better. It's got a little bit better heat management than, say, the Ace Beam or the Skill Hunt, for example. So, again, heat management is a thing with electronics, and that applies to these radios. It's something to consider when you're out in the field. I notice a lot of guys who say, oh, let me get a you know small radio. It can does, does 5 watts. I'll be fine. You'll be fine for a very short period of time. You have to take that 5 watts, back it back down to, say, maybe a watt out or 500 milliwatts out. And that's your real talking output power for a prolonged conversation. So I've done that when I'm on the hills, personally. I'll back my radios out from a high power to low power on purpose. I can, can also pr uh, preserve the batteries, the level output uh, the battery capacity is a little bit longer when you're out in the field and we did mention it before but the options being able to recharge your radios in the field and run them off external power sources is also invaluable which is can be a, a very very good thing especially for the smaller radios which can take usually usb type of power uh, there are other options i do have cables for these radios here to charge them in the field and even the vx170 over here too Uh, oh, thanks, Risen. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, take your time. You know, I, I realize it's a lot of information to go over, and uh, I do apologize for not uh, interacting a little bit more. Uh, I guess that's the whole point of being alive, being able to talk to you guys. But, uh, yeah, I hope that kind of helps a little bit, Risen. I know it's a lot of a lot of stuff to digest, but I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Now, do you guys have any questions about, like, radios, set up, setups, and things like that? Let's, let's do some Q&A before, uh, you know, we close it up. I want to see what you guys think and uh, – or – looking for okay pharmacy no no worries man uh, i know your wi-fi is on the fritz but uh sorry to hear that but it's good to see you in in the chat my friend um uh, we gotta get, get, get we gotta get a chance to chat on the uh, beacon repeater uh, I'll, I'll be on the beacon repeater probably this uh weekend working up there so uh i'll i'll, I'll give a shout out um I think I got a 12-hour shift coming up. And uh, I usually join, I think, on the, uh, what is it, the 730 net on Beacon. I usually jump on that. I think I can make the uh, the Woodstock repeater up there, too, from my handheld in the uh, campground. So I'll try to, I'll, I'll see if you're on there. I'll throw out my call signs a couple times and uh, see if you're there. Uh, teacher class, yeah, uh, I, I I could do that, Brett. I'm I'm not really a very good teacher in terms of like uh, structured teaching. It's more of a hands-on kind of thing, you know. Like uh, I'm not very formal. I'll put it that way. Uh, I should be. I should be more prepared. <laughs> there you go, right? Um, but yeah, I, I don't mind teaching, talking about radios at least, or answering questions about them. Uh, that's a kind of a fun thing. It's always fun for me to talk about gear because you know I'm a nerd. And that's what nerds do. So, absolutely.
ACR protect. Yeah, I, I'm glad it, the info helped you out a lot with it. So any questions, just uh, shoot me an email or, you know, tell me on the chat here. We'll give it a few more minutes and then I'll uh, close down shop here. I do have another video I'm working on and it looks like it's finished rendering. I just got a, uh, a waste packet review coming out in a few hours. So we'll get that up and running. And uh, I think I got another flashlight review to do. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, EDC options, I think my favorite EDC options are these two radios here. Just hands down oh, in terms of number of usage, the VX1R and the VX7R. VX7R because it's rugged and bulletproof. This because it's the smallest radio I, I have that does everything that I want it to do. And I usually combine these guys with, like, say, the uh, Midnight Manager. This is a 3-in-1 tool. I've talked about this many times on my channel. It's got a pen. It's got a light. It's got a cutting tool. So it's got a little bit of everything plus my communications tool. If I had to just pick two things to for the day and I was limited to size, these are the two things I would probably pick or the VX7R in this case. But these are the two small micro things. And I could probably get away with maybe an old light for example, like this. I do have one of these in my keychain, so it does come in handy quite a lot. So as far as EDC items go, uh, those are my favorite small EDC items, and I do like using them quite a lot. The VX3R is nice. Unfortunately, it does not run off of USB power like the VX1R one R here. It's more of uh, you take the battery out, drop it in the charger, and it charges the thing, and you can pin another battery in here. I do have a USB charger for the battery itself and a couple other batteries, so... It's a little bit less tethered to a cable, if you will, but it's a little bit more bulk to carry for the VX3R. But nonetheless, the VX3R is a very powerful radio. It's one of my favorite radios. They, they're hard to find, and uh, I've been looking for them too as well. Oh, absolutely, Brett. Uh, take care, my friend. Uh, it's good to see you, Brett, and we'll, uh, we'll chat some more. We'll, tr we'll, we'll try to do it live together soon. That would be fun to do. Okay, so we got Zed. Hello, Zed. Good to see you. Um, so two questions. Uh, we got one question from ACR Protect. So basically, um, for group hunting, I'm assuming you're... I have a few more questions to ask you, but I'm going to assume that you're talking about inside a forest, um, potentially with hills or mountain ranges around you. If you're going to be on one side of the hill and the other guy's going to be on the other side of the hill, you're not going to get 10 miles. You're probably going to get at most, if you're on high power with inefficient robo duck antennas for a hunting group of 10 uh probably about a mile or two if that on high power and uh i'd probably go with uhf radios for that specific that specific scenario now if you're hunting out in the desert that's a different story again i don't know the exact um, parameters but as a general i guess answer to that like with a lot of salt on it uh <laughs> probably a uhf type of radio maybe uh GMRS type of radio. If you can get hooked into a repeater system on top of a high point, and that might make it a little bit easier. But I, I'm assuming you're talking strictly, you know, the ten guys within them by themselves without using a repeater system. Basically, simplex mode, uh, radio to radio, uh, is what I'm assuming you're discussing. Uh, is that correct? And am I or am I far off with that? Okay, I'm correct. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, UHF radios, you could also do if you want an option, and I didn't discuss this before, and uh, if you're still around listening, there's another uh, license-free radio uh, platform you can use other than FRS. It's called MERS, Multiple Use Radio Service. You can use that both for business and private use without any licensing fees, and you get a lot more wattage out of it. The thing is, it's in the VHF range of about, I think, 154, 151 megahertz, right, right, right about thereabouts there. Uh, that is the range of, and it's only five channels to use, but but it's VHF, and you can transmit up to two watts of output power compared to, I think, FRS is like, I want to say, I don't remember the output, but it's like, I think, 200 milliwatts with the exception of one or two of those channels. I, I don't remember the exact... Um, specifications for that but uh, MERS you can also connect an external antenna and use that with 
the radio system. You're you're allowed to do that legally speaking. So uh, not only can you hook it up to your car, you can use it as a portable handheld. So that might make a little bit more sense for your hunting group of 10. And here's what we'd usually do. We do what we call relays in the ham radio community, meaning <clears throat> we have a net, right? Uh, if one guy checks in and the other, like say you check in one out of 10 and you're trying to get to number seven in the list or number seven, radio man number seven, and he's out of your range, uh, there's still eight other radio guys who can say, hey, radio number one is trying to contact you, number seven. How copy? And you can say, okay, I need a relay. And then you can pass information back and forth that way while you're hunting. Now, keep in mind when you're hunting, you, I assume you want to be as silent as you can and as orderless as you can in your situation. So you might have to use like ear PTT items to reduce the sound effect, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not a hunter, so I don't know these things in particular, but you want to consider that too as well when you're hunting. But you can do stuff like that in your group of 10. So that could overcome some of the terrain uh, features like mountains and woods and, and things like that. Uh, and uh, we'll get to Zed here if, uh, if you still hear Zed. Sorry. Um, so a uh, reasonable range of digital radios compared to analog without repeaters. So we're talking simplex again. That's a good question. So digital tends to have a better signal to noise ratio than analog. Um, and I think in some cases it can extend out a little bit further. In some cases, not all cases. It depends on which band you're using. So uh, once again, VHF, UHF, uh, wavelengths tend to react differently with different areas. So uh, your question, um, I'm going to assume it's like out in the woods or at least out in the fields, maybe line of sight, maybe in the mountains, or unless you mean urban areas. So in that case, I'll give you a different answer, but I'll, we'll go with like the setting out in the woods, for example, right? I would say VHF works pretty well. The digital signal may go a little bit further, but here's the thing. When it goes out, it goes out completely, meaning you ever, we, if you're around a phone conversation and all of a sudden just drops out or starts going to like a robotic voice, well, that's your information being lost in that digital sending. So that can happen with digital radios as well. I've noticed it like that. And whereas analog, it might give you like an extra uh, few more seconds of actually hearing that signal as it fades out into the noise. So it's more of a gradual fade out, you know, of losing the signal. So there is pros and cons to that but generally digital it just it has much better signal to noise ratio i have a problem with digital personally and it's not anything to say about bad about digital but for me it's hard for me to understand the uh the words in the digital when it's compressed down it sounds a little bit too robotic for me even when it's not being lost out at the fringe edge so but you gotta remember uh digital voice or, or you meant digital radius. So you, you can you can also send information like uh, a text or a beacon. In some cases, like I mentioned before, you can send out a beacon out, and that information can get out really efficiently. So that will go a little bit further than, say, a phone, what we call phone transmissions, right? Analog at that, too. Yeah, okay, roll, yep. So, uh, roll. I, I would say for you, if you don't have your ham license, um, I, I believe you can do digital on MERS channels. It just has to be within the bandwidth. So I didn't discuss bandwidth uh, because it's a little bit complicated. But in general, uh, each radio has certain it has a certain limitation uh, requirement uh, with the FCC that it can only deviate uh, when it's transmitting on a frequency. It can only deviate within like maybe a certain amount of kilohertz left or right of that on a spectrum for example so we have like a you know cross axis here you know you're transmitting inside the middle of the spectrum here you can only deviate to the left and right of that a certain amount um with uh what was i going to say i'm trying to remember uh with digital transmissions you want to make sure you stay within that deviation uh sometimes digital transmissions take up a whole entire bandwidth or a very wide swath of it and that can that could potentially be an issue especially in the mers business bands i think i can't remember if there there's some that are narrow banded but the blue channel and the green channel they're still what we call wide banded channels by law so you can do that on the MERS frequencies on the frs i don't know if they allow digital transmissions so if you don't have your license you're very very limited in terms of 
communications, who you can, you know, options. Uh, of course, uh, I will preface this. I didn't say this before. You can still use any of these radios. You can own them. You can use them in an emergency. Uh, what that means is if it's a life and death situation and you don't have access to your phone or any other methods of communications, you can absolutely pick up these radios, transmit on whatever frequency you want to get help. That is fine. And the judge may give you a lot of uh, flack for that, but in the end, it's totally justifiable. Uh, exigent cir circumstances, I would argue. Um, I'm not a I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to give too much law advice. But let's put it this way: Would you want somebody to potentially die because you don't, you're afraid of getting arrested using a radio, or would you rather get arrested for using the radio, but the person's alive now? Uh, I personally would make the you know I would want them to be alive, and I can probably handle whatever legal consequences come out of that personally so that's just my take on it uh doesn't have to be yours but it's just mine so keep that in mind with ham radio radios you can pick up any radio and transmit on it in an emergency if you don't have a phone or other methods of communication absolutely acr protect uh, have a good night my friend i uh, thanks for staying with us for as long as you can i do appreciate you stopping in and asking the uh the questions um it's good to have you here, and I'm glad you're doing okay there. And enjoy your night, my friend. So let's see if there's any more questions, and I'll probably close it down in a few more minutes here. just want to make sure everybody's got, got some good amount of answers out of this, or at least uh, satisfied. All right, looks like it's uh, kind of winding down. I guess I'll start closing it down. I want to say thank you guys for joining me tonight. This is my second live stream. I'm still getting used to it, uh, still learning it, so I do apologize if things are a little uh, wonky. But I'm glad you guys stopped on by to see the radio presentation. Uh, I'm more than happy to do more radio presentations and go into a little bit more depth about different radios. Uh, it's great to see everybody in here tonight. And... Uh, if you're not in here live that's okay no problem you can always watch it later or do whatever you want that's fine uh thanks for joining me i do appreciate it and uh thanks for watching guys remember if you uh need uh, any questions just contact me in my about section of the page there you can email me or you can leave a comment on the videos there's plenty of videos i have uh regarding the specific type of radios here on the table that you can watch for example i do go over the ft1d i do go over the kenwood thf6a i do mention the motorola and the link a little bit i've talked about the hx202 and the vx1r or vx170 rather i do have multiple videos on my vx7r setup and my vx1r in particular so uh, keep an eye out for that and you can also see uh, some videos that i made a few years back in the field using some of this stuff up on the hilltop you might like that too so with that being said uh, thanks for watching, guys, and I want to wish you guys a good night, and thanks again for joining the live stream. Thanks, Brett. Good to see you. Have a good night, guys.